Hello and welcome to another episode of The Book Table, brought to you by Backroom Whispering Productions. Today we're talking about Storm Dancer by Jay Kristoff. So let's go around and introduce ourselves first, and then we'll talk about how we feel about this book. So I'm Shelley. I have been on a few book tables so far. Um, let's see, I'm in Atlanta. I feel like I've already said all this before, so um, let's just go on. Let's see. Dorothy, I pick you. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Dorothy. I'd like to apologize in advance if you hear any sniffling during this conversation because I'm a bit under the weather. You may recognize me from moderating the religion episode, but I've decided to take a step back from moderating because I have a lot of opinions about this book. Um, I love badass female leads and epic quests, um, and I studied abroad in Japan. Even though I don't know much of the language, I have a lot of respect for the culture. So that's the, the angle that I'm approaching this book from. Rebecca? <laughs> Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, those of you that are familiar with the book table will have heard a lot from me, and I hope you're not sick of me already. Um, but yeah, I'm in South Bend, Indiana, and I enjoyed the book overall, but we'll get to that in a minute. So on to you, Mad. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Mad. Like Rebecca, you've probably heard far too much of me on this podcast. I'm a creative producer out in Richmond, Virginia, and I do not have a massive background or understanding of Japanese culture and history outside of the Japanese media that I have consumed. So I'm coming at this from a probably what would be considered ignorant perspective when it comes to the background. But we will get to more of my thoughts later, so let's go to our new person, Steven. Hello. You probably heard of me from nothing at all, given this is the first time I'm actually on here. But I have a little, at least a little bit of a background in some forms of history, living in New York City right now, and I'm pretty excited to be here. Yay! Okay, so let's start with our general overview, how we feel about the book. You can give it a star rating on whatever scale you'd like, but um, well, yeah, let's go around and do that. I will not do this because I haven't actually finished the book, so uh, <laughs> I'm about 40% through the book. Four stars out of ten, then. Easy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, but let's just go around. So, Dorothy? Oh, I did my uh, Goodreads review of this book earlier today, and I ended up giving it three stars. Um, I leaned, if there were half stars available, I think I would say 3.5, because I did enjoy a lot a lot of aspects about it. I liked the world. I found the world really rich and interesting, um, but there were so many very, very frustrating aspects that held me back from giving it a four or five. I think I would cautiously recommend it if someone was very interested in dystopian or diesel punk kind of books, but um, I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that I would give it more than 3.5 stars, but not quite four stars. Um, so maybe I'll give it 3.7 stars. Um, <laughs> And I think I like I really, really, really enjoyed it. I think that there were parts of it that were certainly flawed, um, which is why I don't think I can do quite four stars. But I would highly recommend it because I think even though it certainly had its flaws, and I guess if you come from a background and understand Japanese language and culture, it's pretty frustrating to read, I think, is what we're going to be talking about in this. But um, from my perspective... It was just a lot of fun, and I think that most people would just have a lot of fun reading it, and that's kind of what reading fantasy is about to me, so I would say yes, give it a read. I was going to say that I'm a bit more like you, Rebecca, in that I definitely had a lot of fun with this book. I have to be very careful in that I'll say I have read the entire trilogy. Um, I actually read it back in April of 2015. So it has been a little while and I have to keep refreshing myself and make sure I don't accidentally say something that's from the latter two books. But just on Storm Dancer, I think I gave it a solid like four out of five because I did have a lot of fun with it, despite the fact, like Rebecca, I'll admit there were definitely things that frustrated me and that I found kind of irritating about it, but I still had a lot of fun. And I think it probably does help that I don't necessarily have a background or very thorough uh, knowledge base of Japanese history and culture. So a lot of those things, which I think irritated some of the other people who were involved in this um, particular book club, didn't irritate me as much because I didn't have the knowledge base to be properly irritated by them. 
Well, and I'm not a scholar of Japanese uh, language or culture in any way. I just, um, before reading it, I had read some reviews and some discussions, and the things that were pointed out seemed very valid to me. Um, the author actually said that most of his background research was through Wikipedia. So um, <laughs> when I encountered those in the book, I noticed. I would probably have to give it probably about the same of a three and a half, probably three stars out of five. Just because, again, I think the Wikipedia bit shows somewhat. I found the imagery in particular, some of the sort of industrial wastelands of the cities of the islands particularly interesting. But I feel that the everything in the kitchen sink approach to a lot of the technology and um, details probably it cost a little bit of the focus of the book, which I can get to a little bit later. And I feel that probably near the end as well, where we can talk about it, perhaps in the third half, things got a little bit slow when the storyline and the characters itself started staying in one place for a while. And overall, I would suggest it, but um, it wouldn't be my first choice. What do you guys think if you had a favorite aspect of the book? Um, what would you say it is? Dorothy? I agreed with Stephen. I liked um, how dirty the world was. Just... Reading mm -hmm. those descriptive passages, I mean, it really, like, it, it made me kind of grossed out at some points, just how polluted stuff was, um, how dependent they were on the Lotus for, like, the fuel and for the um, the drug reasoning and, like, for medicine. It was a really interesting world and a really interesting concept. Um, just the descriptions of the world and how disgusting and dirty it was. I feel like the writing made you really feel that. Although, of course, the writing did have its flaws, but he definitely created an interesting setting for his characters, and that would be my favorite aspect. Um, yeah, so I'm going to open a little bit of a can of worms here because I know that um, some people are actually going to have some criticisms about this later on, but my favorite thing was actually the mythology and the general world building and the mythos of the whole world. I was like super into that and really fascinated, I think, both from a religious studies perspective and also just, you know, as a reader who's into stories that do things that are different. Um, I thought basically the sort of religious and spiritual aspects of the book that were created and the spiritual background of everything was really, really just fascinating to me and a, just a little bit unique, but also kind of rooted in that sort of Far Eastern folklore, but not quite. And I was really into that. So, yeah, I'm kind of like Dorothy. I was really into his descriptions of the filthiness of the whole thing. I remember when I first read it, I felt like really grimy while I read it. And I said, man, if you're making me feel like this, when I clearly know I'm sitting in like clean clothes and a clean chair and all of that, and I'm feeling kind of gross, you're doing a pretty good job at immersing me in your world. Although, as Dorothy also said, there were some issues with some of the descriptive passages in that it sort of would feel a bit like he was just sort of listing off things from Wikipedia, which as much as I don't have, like I said, a great amount of background in um, Japanese history and culture and stuff. Even I can notice when some of the writing is a little info dumpy, but I did love his descriptions of the pollution caused by all these Lotus products, by the uh, complete addiction that came with it. And I will say that I, I also kind of enjoyed a couple of the characters. Like I did like Yukiko, even if she made some decisions that drove me a little up the wall sometimes. But I think I also very guiltily liked Buru because he was kind of a sass monster. And I'm admittedly uh, a sucker for sass. And so he kind of kept me giggling through the book. I don't know if that was meant to be his intent, but having things like that made it easier for me to just continue trekking on through the book as quickly as I did. I think I read it in one sitting, which means it probably took me like two hours to read. Wow, that's pretty impressive considering I still haven't finished. <laughs> I just got distracted <laughs> by other books, though. I've read, like, three books in this, like since I started this, so. And Stephen, any favorite aspects to add? Sure. I, I guess everyone else has already talked a little bit about the, uh, I'd say, very high-quality descriptions of, I guess, the Shima Islands here and its different parts already. So I suppose to try to at least 
forge, you know, a slightly different opinion because I, I, I agree with all of that. Something else I did like about the book was definitely some of the characters' relationships as a family. It wasn't the best writing about the family I've ever seen, but so many of these types of novels that follow a um a young character with family issues either have absent parents or I guess you could say abusive step parents or parents that come up later. Just the idea of having a flawed father character who is still, I mean, we can definitely talk about this later as well. There were some issues I think with that characterization, but overall I did like, especially through the first half of the book, that you did get a sense that these are people who know each other. These main characters aren't just random people. And that actually the main character is coming from a culture and a background instead of just popping up out of nowhere, as is so often the case with uh, a few other dystopian novels. So that and, of course, just um, some of the visual description that we discussed already. Mm -hmm. So from what I read, yeah, I also really liked the world building. But then let's move on to least favorite aspects. So for me, I guess the things that irritated me were weird uses of language. Well, and, and Shelley, you actually did study Japanese. Yeah, so, that's right. Well, I'm irritated by some of these language issues just with my very minimal knowledge because I lived in Japan for a month and I've seen some anime. How, how did the language issues, did they rub you the wrong way or did you not notice? Well, I mean, I definitely noticed them. And I think just because there were there were words from a language that I'm interested in. I was even even the ones that I didn't know. I wanted to go look them up and see if there were actual words, or you know, if he smashed some words together or things like that. I don't know. I'm not that easy to to irritate, so I feel like I could live with it. But it it does irritate me when he just you know throws in words the way they're not used, or yeah, just just pulls things and then like smashes words together. Or the highs. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just say, just saying, just, you know, change change the word for yes. Shelley, you study English. Japanese, hi. <laughs> exactly. For someone who's not super familiar with the language, I mean, I've watched some anime, but I don't call myself fluent or really familiar in any regard. Um, what are some of the more egregious examples of this word smashing? Just so that I have a better understanding of what was really irritating people. Um. Well, so I guess the the big one is probably Arashi Tora, which is the the storm tiger thing that is the whole book, the base of the whole book. Because um, normally when you you smash some words together, you would change the way they're pronounced. Um, I did not look up how this would probably be pronounced if it was a real word. But so there's a, basically for every word, there's like a Japanese reading and a Chinese reading. So when you combine words, you usually use a different reading than when they're separate. Um, if that makes any sense. But yeah, so there were a couple of things like that. And then just the little things like the country being called the Shima Isles, where Shima means island. So it's the island isles. Like that kind of thing was, was what mostly irritated me. And then there were there was two that popped out to me. Again, don't speak Japanese at all. Um, but notice these in the reviews and then notice them constantly while reading was hi. Um, meaning yes, just kind of shoehorned in for every chance that we would use yes. Um, like at the end of sentences, like, Shelly, you study Japanese, hi. It, there are other Japanese words that would be used there, I think, uh, ne, right? Ne. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, that's but, true. So he just used it as like a universal translation from yes, and then he said sama, which is an honorific, so it should be at the end of someone's name, like Shelly sama, and he used it as... Um, a, a like word address, by itself. A word mm -hmm. to address someone with. And it was weird because he used other suffixes properly. Like he'd use san and chan, like, you know, attached to people's names. But for some reason, just that one. I think there was even a situation where he did attach it to someone's name, but then he just, you know, started using that by itself. Yeah. So instead of like, Shelly Sama, will you open the door? It was just Sama, will you open the door? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it just dangles there without being attached to anything yeah oh there was another thing i noticed that was um so japanese has some uh, some loan words from english and also from other languages but one of the one of the popular ones is salary man so someone who works in like a generic office and so he wrote that but like in a japanese way so it was it was spelled with r's and it had like a 
extender over the eye and things like, like that. Sorry, so, man, I think, yeah. yeah Something yeah, along those sorry, lines. Yeah. Sorry, man. And then he, he tried to do that with other words. Like, he took a Japanese word and added, like, man to the end of it. I can't remember what the specific one was, but he tried was to... Was it the like, soldiers? Like, that. the bushy man or something, perhaps? Yeah, that might have been it. So it's like, he, he tried to, to be creative with the language in the ways that it doesn't really... That doesn't really happen. I mean, I guess I guess he was taking some artistic license. Yeah, I was a little bit annoyed with all that. On the other hand, though, he did forget a few times. The ship they ride on is called the Thunder Child, which is so Anglo. It's literally the name of a uh, warship in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And one time, an acetylene <laughs> oh torch is mentioned as well. I guess he forgot to make that um, lotus-powered. Um, in a few cases, I feel, uh, a few things like that seem to slip through the cracks. And I feel that that probably does speak to his lack of familiarity with the culture. Not that I have any significant familiarity myself, but there are a few, you know, little holes poked through the facade <laughs> in a few different points. And I think the book would have been better uh, with a little bit um, tighter use of foreign words if that was the actual author's intention to remain consistent. I wonder if the American <laughs> editors didn't catch it just because it's just like UK slang and he is Australian. I'm surprised that like none of the Australian editors caught that. Like the US editors I can maybe understand, but the Australian ones I would have thought they'd be like, um, dude, maybe we should change that. See, what's for me, um, what's the most interesting for me, I think, listening to this um, and just thinking about my own experience of the book is that we say, like, clearly he doesn't have a lot of familiarity. It's a lot of, like, Wikipedia knowledge. He does this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. But then I feel like a lot of us don't necessarily have a lot of familiarity with Japanese culture or the language necessarily. But we all recognize these issues, too. Like, literally, my exposure to Japanese culture anything is that I have watched anime, usually dubbed in English. And I still was bothered by the high thing. I Like, I knew that was wrong. Um, and so it just strikes me as really interesting that, you know, we have this group of us where, like, Shelly, you've studied the language. Dorian, you've had some exposure. Mad, not really. Steven keeps saying, yeah, I don't really have that much exposure. I do watch some anime as well, just to yeah. round out the group. But, yeah, that doesn't give you much of anything for actual. Yeah. Um, and yet we like recognized these issues reading and were bothered by them. So it just makes me wonder, like, I mean, how did that slip through the cracks in a way? Like, how can you choose to write a book that's based on a society and like have such little knowledge of it that people that don't really know anything about it are recognizing that you've done it wrong? The excuse that he used that it's not set in Japan, it's set in the Shima Isles, but uh, we got samurai, we got geisha, we got katana, we got bushido, we've got a shogun, like... You even I, have the Chinese, even though they're called the neo-chonins, I think. Yeah. That they show up as well. <laughs> I don't think you can say that you're not in Japan. I mean, okay, yeah. so Japan doesn't have lotus-powered airships or whatever, but... When you're borrowing that heavily from a culture, you need to respect it at least a little bit. Yeah, it, it's a little hard to say that you've everything from that you've taken everything from a country and transplanted it into you know the steampunk version, and it's suddenly not the same country, even if it's you know what is it, what is it you called it diesel punk? Mm, you wrote that diesel punk. Right? Yeah, we can talk yeah. about the steampunk question later because I'd argue it's probably not, <laughs> but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's something that's probably that's left lotus later. punk. Uh, I suppose. I, I did find the um, <laughs> overuse of the whole Lotus thing, I felt did. In fact, I, I got a little section here that I had seen. But the point was, it was the, the captain of the Thunder Child talking to Yukiko saying that, you know, the Lotus Blossom provides tea, it provides anesthetics, it provides drugs, it provides rope, it provides fuel. It, it's just... I understand that you want to have a society that is heavily dependent on this one resource that is additionally cursed, that it is really destroying the country. But I feel in order to try to make things consistent, the author went way overboard <laughs> and it tried like to cram in the lotus to everything. Yes. I mean, th there's the lotus and there is food, which is – I don't think they go into too much detail than perhaps rice. At, um, I mean – 
honestly, there's almost nothing the Lotus Plant doesn't do. And that was an issue I had with it, especially because I don't know um, if either or if any of you are familiar with Warhammer 40k. But the whole idea of the chainsaw swords, chainsaw katanas here, and powered armor, there's a lot of that sort of preposterone type of cribbing of ridiculous concepts that I feel kind of detracted from the storyline for me, that it's a little bit hard to take seriously. For example, um, the Lotus Men, when it turns out in the end that they have powered armor and a sort of wireless internet hive mind and jetpacks and you know different types of radio transponders i feel that he was so enamored by some of the concepts he was writing whether it be use of the lotus or the idea of a techno cult of the um the lotus guild that in a few different cases he took those further than they probably should have gone and this is an argument we can bring up again towards the forest romance with the sea green eyed samurai whose name i do oh not God, kill me, please. which was i think we can probably <laughs> all agree one of the worst segments of the book that's uh, yeah that that as well yeah i was just gonna say one of my least favorite bits was that whole bit with the green eyed samurai oh, Kiro, I mean, that just, was yeah, name, romance right? in general Hero, yes. Yes. I just think in general, romance was not done particularly well. And it was no. probably the biggest point where I started groaning and rolling my eyes the whole time I was reading. And I was like, please, please make it end. Just just, just let this stop, please. Yeah, I'm going to be real, though. My, my least favorite. So we've been talking about the language thing, which I think was most people's least favorite language and cultural appropriation that was um, wrong on many levels. But for me, honestly, my least favorite thing were the relationships. And I'm going to put a blanket term on that because I'm talking about literally like every person to person relationship I had issues with there were I mean I guess there were some that basically were not really a part of the book and so I didn't care about them but I had a lot of issues with the father daughter relationship and what happened with that and then mm -hmm. the like even I agree with that <laughs> yeah both of the like the love stories essentially or like the love trend or even like I don't even know if you can call it that whatever was happening with that uh, I had many, many issues and I felt in a lot of ways like and, and this wasn't even technically a YA. So it was kind of confusing to me because it felt sort of like Kristoff trying to insert a very common YA trope like, oh, crap, I guess I can't write this book unless we have like two guys and a girl and there's some like romantic tension and stuff going on there. But it was so out of place and so poorly done that I was just like wanted to bang my head against a wall, basically. So that was the least favorite for me. OK, does anyone else have other least favorite things? <laughs> or we can get into more in the spoiler section. Yeah, I can add uh, one other thing, which was um, uh, we will talk about this later. But the book is divided. I would I would at least argue into three major segments. And I feel I, I mean, one is, you know, initially in you know the capital on the ground then the second is the adventure and the third sort of the aftermath and i feel the transitions between those three segments are really pretty clunky and it took a little while for Kristoff to shift gears and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well but the main issue being for me that i feel like he would write a better book if it had a more consistent narrative perhaps one main journey because the transitions he had i was just not quite a fan of I will say that in the later books, he does get better about that because he shifts to a kind of more consistent narrative. Um, oh, good. But but I agree with you. It was a little clunky in the first one. But Kinslayer and End Singer, which are the other two books, they are much more consistently paced. And I think it's because the story is more focused and it actually is a little slower. I think he was trying to do so much in relatively few pages. Oh, yes. It's a oh, surprisingly yes. short book. Yeah, I mean, it is a surprisingly short book, especially when you compare it to the other two, because the other two are significantly longer compared to the first one. And I think it he does better with the longer books because he can sort of take his time and just keep a very consistent pace through his story that way. I think you've just cemented me not to read the sequels. Because I felt that the, the <laughs> pacing problems, if, if you're calling this one relatively short, I, it took me a long time to get through. I actually switched from my library book to an ebook version because I hoped I could look up some of the terms. When he dumps complex terms in and then doesn't explain them, as opposed to when he puts simple terms in and then over explains them. <laughs> anyway, 
But it took me a very long time because I had to keep putting it down and taking a break from this Wikipedia info dump. So yeah, I'm not going to go on if the other ones are longer. <laughs> yeah, I had the same problem in the beginning, actually. There's, there were just so many adjectives in each sentence when he was trying to describe like the city. Like There was a whole chapter that they just walked, I think, to the docks from, uh, I don't even remember where now. <laughs> they just if walked they were to in the a docks. bar, I think, or a gambling yeah. den. That was it. That's right, the yeah. gambling den. They walked from there to the docks, and it just took so long for them to, you know, everything they passed had to be described in super detail. And it got better as I read farther, but still haven't finished the book, so it, it was it was still slowing me down. Just his the way of describing things. Okay, well, we so we talked about world building. Does anyone have anything to add to that? I feel like we covered a lot of it, but just anything general that is spoiler free. I was just gonna say that I really wanted a thunder tiger when this was done. That was it. I was just like, this might be the one thing I want more than a dragon. <laughs> I just want one. <laughs> this is it. Like we've capped. I don't think there's anything else I want more. The but only he can got talk the fluff. It. He does have the fluff and the sass. Like if you yes. give me fluff and sass and like sharp talons and it flies. So I'm like, oh wait, this is literally everything I want in a mythical pet. <laughs> this is everything okay. I want. <laughs> okay, but it's a griffin. Like, I don't know, I don't have any problems with it. I thought the Thunder Tiger was great, and I loved the character. But it's not original, it's straight up a griffin. So I just have to throw that in here as, like, your resident nerd, I guess. But it already existed. There's also something else that already exists. The Iron Thrower, the Iron Slinger. Yeah. It's a gun. It's a gun. <laughs> Call it a gun. Why did you have to come up with a meaning for it? Why? Why would you do that? I think that kind of goes back to the preposterone thing I was talking about with the with the powered armor and the sword sort of thing that they're skipping, you know, multiple centuries of firearms development from like suddenly it randomly a multi shot pistol just comes up out of nowhere. It's like uh, a gun, but it's more badass. So I'm yes. gonna call it an iron <laughs> slinger. Well, it's also powered by lotus fumes of course it is. as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone else uses spears or swords. Yeah. Except yeah. not the not not the uh, foreigners. What do the they foreigners? do mention that in a throw out line that the foreigners use um, uh, electricity basically. What? Yeah, that's right. I missed that Lightning part. Powered. And that's yeah, why it's, they it's, lost. It's, it's a throwaway line at the beginning where, um, in the broad sweep of the description of the city, they mention the round eyed gaijin and uh, how they use lightning powered ships, and they've got perfidious blue eyes and close cropped hair and foreign clothing but for some reason they still get to trade it well, is a surprisingly cosmopolitan light uh, city powered ships are so much more eco they are <laughs> and wait they have blue eyes but the the green-eyed samurai is totally cool yeah green-eyed samurai is cool but not not the people with the animal pelts and the blue eyes because they're they're fur and yeah <laughs> that, that was another sort of you know randomly you thrown in thing though how can you have a sort of feudal japan based country which was known to be you know for, for the most part very anti-foreigner and yet they have all these scenes of a pretty lively trade and vast empire it just seemed kind of like another anachronism of trying to cram in every era of japanese history into one like a uh, like a poorly assembled plum pudding <laughs> Oh my god, you're my favorite That's person. That's a awesome analogy. Oh my god, I'm so happy right now. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, well, um, it's a good talk on world building. Okay, so let's move into spoiler heavy talk. Okay. So our first point here is the relationships. So um, I guess let's start with the family relationships. Did you think they were believable? Did you like them? How did you feel? I guess my opinion on that would depend on the phase of the book that they occurred in. And that in the beginning, I thought the family relationships were, I mean, they were all right. I mean, Yukiko's uh, relationship with her father is strained, but, you know, he has a um, fictional opium addiction. And... Um, it just seemed decent enough, and the dislike she has for um, I was just Katsumi or Kasumi, who um, I'm still not quite sure part of her role. But I feel that as the big spoiler comes up later on, that Yorimoto killed uh, her mother, I feel that sort of cheapened a lot of the different family uh, relationships we had seen earlier on. Given that, at least from my own perspective, 
over the many years from that, I didn't get the impression that that was worth keeping secret and that I didn't get the um, impression that her father, uh, Masaru, what really had it in him to have that sort of personality to try to take the secret to his grave or whatever. And I feel that really reversed a lot of the, you know, later redemptive arc that they have for Masaru coming in later using his secretly held powers to speak with animals to um, sort of stop y- Yorimoto. Uh, that, that, that whole arc I felt at the end kind of became a little bit frayed as, um, Overall, I guess I can let someone else talk, you know, to add something else. But I feel that ultimately Masaru's kind of odd redemption, Kasumi's, you know, noble sacrifice in the uh, jail and those sorts of relationships didn't really do it for me. And that ultimately, I think the relationship with with, uh, Buru and Yukiko is definitely the best of the book. Yeah. Um, so I have two things. The first is unrelated because I realized that I missed a really incredible opportunity. Uh, cause the entire time I was waiting for someone to ask the least favorite part so I could say Jenny was my least favorite part. Worst narrator <laughs> ever. Um, so Very important part. wait, Becca, who, who is that? Okay. Yeah, so Jennifer us. Aikido is the narrator of the audible version of the book. And I don't want to like slam her too much because I feel like probably other things she's read are okay. But this was terrible. Like, it was honestly so awful that I almost couldn't get through it, even though it was really important for me to be doing the Audible because I was listening to it while I was doing reporting at work, which is the best time for me to be consuming it as a story. But, um, yeah, like, so bad. I even had Mad listen to just, like, the first, I think it was, like, minute and a half when she was at my house last weekend, and she she made me turn it off. Like, it was, like, just... The timing, the cadence, the everything was just so bad. We had kind of a running joke in our group where we were discussing this book as we were reading it about my hashtags about Jenny. Um, because I just was so like, I just couldn't believe how bad it was at some points. But anyway, that's not the point. Going back to family relationships. Um, so yeah, I would agree, I think with you, Stephen, that actually at the beginning, I wasn't super bothered by the father daughter relationship. I thought it made sense that it was strained. Um, I, there were some parts where it got like kind of annoying with her talking about how much she hated him slash telling him that she hated him. Um, and why I just felt like there was a, there was one scene where they were on the Thunder Child where she like goes through this whole history of everything that's been wrong with their relationship. And it felt super contrived to me because I was like, I feel like you would have talked about this stuff before and this doesn't really need to be happening right now. And this is not a conversation that feels organic or natural in any way. So that bothered me. But otherwise, I felt like it made sense um, what her relationship with him was like. So then later when just like for pretty much no reason, she just kind of snaps into the, oh my God, but my dad has done everything he's done for me and I love him so much and I must save him. I was like, what is happening right now? This doesn't make sense. I don't get it. And the fact that then they were just fine on their next meeting, essentially, where it was like, oh, I love you so much. I'm so happy to see you and we're going to get through this and it's going to be great. Given that they supposedly had this really messed up background and actually the last time you saw them together, it was like he like hit her and I thought was going to seriously yes. injure her because her head like hit a wall and that's not good. But anyway, but then it's just all of a sudden, oh, no, we're great. Like, we're going to get through this together. And I love you, dad. And I was just, that was really jarring. Didn't make sense to me. Didn't work for me like at all. And I felt like in a lot of ways the father character was sort of this afterthought on Kristoff's part, like, oh, crap, but I need him for the story, especially towards the end when it was like, oh, magically, he also has this power, and we're going to use that to defeat the bad guy. I was, I don't know, it just felt like super inorganic, like really shoved in there, didn't make sense given the entire story and everything that had been built up to that point. So that relationship, the father-daughter relationship, I just had many, many issues with. And yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Yeah, I felt that the family backstory was really poorly exposed. I actually, Mm -hmm. and this could have been because I was doing some skimming, uh, never figured out what happened to her brother. I'm assuming that he was killed, but like, I didn't really find that in the book. Um, Oh, yeah. snake, uh, Snake bite. Okay, sure. That's all I remember. Did, um, didn't their pet dog die from the in the same 
incident or am I okay? I yeah, switching that up. separate. But, like but they I don't just know. they just shoved all that in. Um, yeah, <laughs> and they it's all in jarring flashbacks. Yeah, written in italics so you know they're important. Oh, it may have not been in my version. Um. Anyway, and then there's the fact that the dad is a drug addict, and drug addicts are not necessarily known for keeping secrets. Uh, so to me, it would seem more natural for that kind of character to be like, well, the government hates your mother, like, in that situation, rather than keeping it quiet. Exactly. The government hates your mother. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Yeah, the family dynamics were definitely not a strong point of the book. I think, I'll speak for myself again, it has been a while since I read this. I think I became very tunnel visioned once Baru and Yukiko started interacting, like because they became- It is the best relationship um, of the book. I'll I'll agree with Stephen. Yeah, exactly. Because it was the best one, I became very tunnel visioned. And then anytime they were on, I sort of went, okay, everybody needs to go off to the side because I enjoy this dynamic and I'm just going to enjoy this dynamic. I- it's really hard for me to talk then also about Kin or Kin, um, because he's kind of a second tier protagonist is the phrase that I use. Like he's sort of important, but not important enough to really be called our protagonist. But he takes such center stage in the other two books. And in the first book, he irritated the living daylights out of me a lot of the time. Um, like I found him interesting in terms of trying to contrast with Yukiko, I think, but he still irritated the living daylights out of me and he does get better. So I feel bad saying that about him. In but this it was book. so cool but, how his suit was yeah. plugged into his skin and his brain. I'm just a complete sucker for that, man. <laughs> we can move on to the, the romantic relationships. That's fine. One last note, though. What do you remember about Kasumi? I was rereading some of this. And for some reason, I had a real blind spot about that character. She's nominally very important, but I feel that she was very poorly described, both in motivation and action. And I'm having trouble recalling exactly uh, much of her role for the book. Yeah, isn't she like the stepmother? Like Literally, <laughs> yes. all I remember about her is that she was the father's girlfriend and potentially before the mom died was the father's girlfriend. And so there was like some blaming on Yukiko's part that mom had left because of that. But I don't actually, honestly, I'm going to be real with you until like the very end where you kind of get a lot of her in the prison scenes. I <laughs> didn't realize that she was much of a character at all. <laughs> I actually couldn't, especially when she was first introduced, I was like, awesome, another another present. female who's not a geisha, like, this is sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I couldn't even figure out how old she was or, like, what skills she brought to the party or anything like that. So he gets really descriptive about some stuff, and like we said about the sludgy sliminess and whatever, but I couldn't figure out if he was Yukiko's age or her dad's age or a grandma well, or like made out of robot parts or whatever. I didn't. I, re- I reread anything. the start, and there is a throwaway line that maybe she's about 35. Oh, okay. But I, that's You're only more beca- observant than I am. Well, no, I had to reread it though, because I did not remember this at all, and I was just skipping through, and it's the same segment that says that the captain of the Thunderchild is about 24, and I thought, wait, what? I thought he was like 50, but no, apparently not. Is he really 24? Yeah, they mentioned something about how um, Kasumi's about a decade older than the captain, and the captain is like, you know, 25 or something, oh. like, around that. Again, it's a throwaway line, but I was literally okay. looking at my Kindle on the way back, and this was something I spotted, which I had totally forgotten about. Wow, because I definitely kind of like you thought he was somewhere around like 50 from <laughs> my remembering. Oops. He's described that way. My certainly. bad. Just a little different. Yeah. <laughs> they described his, uh, his mechanical breather in much greater <laughs> detail than actually who he was to an extent. Poor secondary character. Alas. I mean, that's the important stuff. Anyway, so did we want to go into talking about the uh, the romance that I know you guys all loved? Uh-huh. I'd like to start. I'd like to start. Yes. Go for it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So as a lover of romance, this was appalling. Honestly, like one of the worst things I've ever read, particularly everything with, what is even his name? Hiro, the green-eyed samurai? It's like Lord Hiro, the Kazumitsu elite, I guess. But yeah, Hiro. Yeah. He's yeah, my we'll hero. Go Sam- yes. We're gonna go with Green-Eyed Samurai. Um, See so Green-Eyed Samurai. Like, this is emphasized every time. 
Right? Because he has green eyes and that's what matters about him. And honestly, like, in retrospect, I don't think there really was anything else to him. Um, well, has anyone and- seen Cowboy Bebop? Because it really yes. gave me... Yeah. Because they're, they're searching yes. for the samurai who smells like sunflowers, right? Yeah. So that's just all I could think about. Oh, my God. Every time they no, that wasn't that. Cowboy it's Bebop. Samurai Shampoo, wasn't- right? Yeah. Oh, oh my Samurai God. Shampoo. Did I, did I say Cowboy Bebop? Same, well, yeah. Yes. It's the Sorry. same studio, though. Yes, Samurai Shampoo. Okay, but Samurai Shampoo is amazing. And I'm yes. going to be honest, that was, like, in the back of my head throughout this, because you get the introduction, right? Throughout the book, she's just constantly, like, oh, having dreams of the green-eyed samurai, and then, like, chiding herself for thinking about a boy in the midst of everything. So it's like, oh, do you think this is going to come up later and he's going to appear? Um... But yeah, no, it was terrible. I don't like I remember talking in our discussion when we were talking about this in book club, like I thought I had missed parts or like things that had happened because everything was so abrupt and there was no build. And like the characters, you don't see any like actual organic relationship or anything happening. It's just like, oh, lady, you're so beautiful. I would do anything to protect you. And then all of a sudden they're like sleeping together and I don't even know what's going on. And then she has a moment where she realizes she doesn't love him, which is like, okay, what's happening? I don't know. And then, oh, surprise, he's evil. Like, I don't know. Just that whole thing, literally none of it was good. Wait, hold hold on, hold on. Basically, the first time that they sleep together, it's because she's dealing with something, right? I don't remember exactly what. Yeah, but they don't, like, build to that. It's just, like, she's, like, really devastated and then, like... at. At least unless I really did miss something, but people were telling me I hadn't. Then she just, like, wakes up in bed with him and, like... No, it's him. it's when they cut Biru's feathers, right? Yeah. So it's, like, I actually... Mm-hmm. I was, like, oh, this is kind of, like, interesting and progressive. She's, like, using sex as an escape and, like, to make herself feel better and, like, get away from this world and all these issues and whatever. Oh, this is interesting. And then suddenly it was, like, ah, oh, we are now boyfriend-girlfriend. Like, uh, You can just, like, do it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but it's Yeah, just, I'm sorry with you on that one, D. Sorry, go ahead. No, I don't know. It just... Th- that whole thing bothered me. And the thing was that at the beginning, um, Kin, like, the thing with Kin is he really bothered me because he clearly had a crush on her, even though that was also, like, really awkwardly done. Um, and I was super not interested in them at all. But then towards the end, you get, like, this one moment of his perspective about her. And I was like oh, I'm actually kind of, like, into this, sort of. But then it didn't really come to anything, and there were issues. And I just feel like it was so forced and kind of out of nowhere, all of it. Just It was just all not done well. And I can't even articulate very much of it right now, apparently, because I'm so upset about it. So anyway, someone else should talk. It was one of my favorite literary tropes. He was a boy, she was a girl. Can I make it any more obvious? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the answer is yes yes well you can played. make it more obvious because it is possible for boys and girls to like be friends and it's also possible for them to fall in love but what you have here is neither of those hero is also 17 <laughs> yeah Wait, was he really yes and is somehow one of the leading members i guess of the household guard and is 17 mm-hmm. it's the green eyes it's the power Obviously. of the strange. <laughs> <laughs> the sea green eyes. I'm, I apologize. I must emphasize. Um, I'll say I'm with Dorothy more on uh, on the aspect of Yukiko using Hiro for sex initially. Because I, I, I had the same thing where I read it and I went, wow, I'm actually really impressed. Like, go for it, girl. And then it was sort of like lust being mistaken for something more and then it all falling apart. And I admit I found it really clunky. Um Again, with Ken, I found him a little irritating in this book. I'll say that you get his perspective, especially in Kinslayer, hence its title, um, a lot more. And he becomes a little more fascinating that way. But I do think in general, romantic entanglements might not be Kristoff's forte in this book. And I fully empathize because I'm really bad at even trying to write romance. So I usually avoid it, as Rebecca could tell you. (laughs) But perhaps that would have been the better decision on Kristoff's part than he avoiding it would have probably helped the book. Yeah, I'll agree. In this one, I, I th- again, I think it's the problem of trying to actually do too much in too few pages. And so it's all kind of clunky. Um, in the case of Hiro, I wish, honestly, she had just used him for sex and then left him. Like, I actually would have been yeah, perfectly okay see. with that. Me too. That would have been fine. Right. I would have been very impressed. Yeah, that, 
Yeah, I would have been really impressed. And it actually, for me, kind of would have made sense with her character, considering they initially sleep with each other because she needs release. And I'm like, I'm perfectly okay with this being their relationship. Like, this can totally be their relationship. Well, that could also um, be a shoehorned cultural element, too, because just like with the father thing, it's like he kind of snapped into remembering, oh, yes, Japanese people must be very loyal to their families. I feel like he went into this kind of, oh, yes, in this culture, I think that they believe that sex equals love equals marriage. Mm-hmm. That's true. Uh, it could be that. I hadn't considered that. Interesting. The, the greatest romance will still always, for me, just be the the friend romance of Baru and Yukiko. And I'll just sit here and be like, that's the best relationship. And it's if I could call it a bromance, I would. But she's not a bro. So it's a friend. Friendshipping? Mm-hmm. Friendshipping. I mean, she could be a bro. Yeah. A bro. A bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just going to call them the ultimate bromance. <laughs> yeah. All right. So romance, not good. Got it. <laughs> So I guess let's go to the actual like overall plot. So I hear she has to kill the Shogun. I didn't get to that yet in my, my reading, but you guys should talk about it. <laughs> well, the the original quest is, hey, guys, go find this Arashi Tora. And they're like, yes, Which they do extremely rapidly. They just take the yeah. ship out there. This is what, something I mentioned in the no spoilers section. They just take the ship out to where it was reported. And there it is. It was remarkably yeah, I was so easy. Surprised. Yeah, I thought that was, was going to be like the, over, the big full thing throttle the on the plot development. <laughs> they immediately run and do it into the first storm. <laughs> yeah, so that gets resolved. Then she lands in, and you guys can correct me if if I'm wrong or if we need more details or if the cough syrup is messing with my brain. Ship crashes. She and Buru land near this encampment of people who have abandoned society because the Shogun is corrupt and evil, and they've burned off all their clan tattoos, and they're like, BT dubs, the Shogun is corrupt and evil. You should go kill him. And she's like, yeah, great idea. I'm going to go do that. With a scene in between of her fighting demons that appear are very important and then not important. In a, uh, <laughs> as soon as they appear, they're pretty much gone. But the fight happens. But yeah, basically, uh, they say the Shogun's corrupt, and she's like, "Okay, yes, you're right. All right, I'm gonna go do this." And then she does. <laughs> Good story. And it doesn't make that much logical sense to me. I don't know, Rebecca and Matt. What did you guys think? Um, I mean, I think what you just said, where it was just kind of like really abruptly, oh, by the way, this needs to be a storyline, so you're gonna go kill the Shogun. Okay, why not? I'm gonna go do that. Like, that's kind of what it felt like from my perspective. Yeah, I'll agree with that. It it was a really sudden, like, I need to kill the Shogun? Yeah, all right, we can do this. And I was just like, oh, that that was really fast. Is loyalty, like, not a thing? I mean, I'm I'm okay if it's not a thing, but I was kind of under the impression it was a thing, and now this is very sudden, and I'm confused. And I'll be honest, I mean, trying to remember the first book, I the, the plot was sort of negligible for me. I didn't really care about it. I was like, yeah, I'm sure this is a cool story. I just like the characters. And I and I like some of the world description, but I do th- yeah the plot to kill the Shogun. I was like, um, okay, sure, I'll roll with this. Why not? Where's this gonna go? Like, it was e- very sudden. Even people who aren't necessarily the biggest fans of their leader or ruler, they aren't necessarily like, yeah, all right, I'll go assassinate him, um, because you know he's very powerful. He's very protected. Uh, they don't really offer that much alternative to him. They're just like, well, he's bad, so he should go. They don't really set their plan uh, for what will replace him. So it seemed like Yukiko seemed like a pretty reasonable person to me, and that did not seem like a reasonable decision. But also, um, yeah, it's, uh, I know that this comes up in the later books, but still, there's a lot said in the early books not to establish the military and the Shogun as the bad guy, but the guild the very beginning is all about like, oh, they are essentially burning witches. Oh, man, you know, they uh, promote, you know, the development of Lotus tech and the uh, growing of Lotus. They go through so many different hoops to try to establish them as this great, terrible force. And then she's killing the Shogun. This is I feel that uh, perhaps if this book was either written in parts or planned in stages, that at some point Yukiko needed a separate target. And thus kind of went off the rails, explaining the kind of slow moving third portion where she was basically hanging around in the palace waiting for Bruce's um, feathers to grow back. And then they're cut off and then waiting for Kin to build the uh, Icarus wings 
sort of wing Icarus wingtips. I feel that after this move, at the story moves so very rapidly, <laughs> suddenly everything needed to slow down again. And the, uh, as eager as Yukiko was to kill the Shogun, then everything gets slowed down to such an extent that you have to wait another. I don't know how many pages it was. I was on the Kindle, but she is essentially all right with hanging around at the palace for quite some time. Perhaps it is to introduce the Shogun's sister as well. But I feel that her relationship with the Shogun and that was also another weak point. Yeah, it's definitely strange that I agree with just about everything you've said. And I love that you brought up the guild because that was something she should have been focusing on. And Mm -hmm. it's very hard for me to talk about since I read the other two books. But um, I will say that all of the nonsense so that I don't swear very badly right here, uh, all of the nonsense that happens at the end of the first book. um, If there's one thing I did appreciate about the fact it ended up being a series is that he deals with the consequences of everything that happens at the end of the first book and basically how everything kind of hits the fan um, and that there are consequences to every action. And so while like just on this book alone, the, the ending and especially that time she just is sitting in the Shogun's palace just with nothing really to do is incredibly frustrating and it's definitely a problem with the first book. It's Mm -hmm. in terms of the series, it makes sense. This is really hard for me to talk about, but I do wish more time had been spent on the guild in the first book. It takes serious center stage in like the second book and a lot of the third book, but I do wish there had been a lot more of it in the first book because I think it would have fleshed out the first book a lot more. She never asked Kin what a mech abacus is. (laughs) <laughs> Not once. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, what is a mecha abacus? It's mentioned later in the book uh, oh. from Kin's perspective that somehow it's a device that allows all the guildsmen to communicate at the same time about everything. Yeah, and it, abacus like a makes feed. a lot more sense for that than like yeah. a keyboard. <laughs> no, but it's, 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 it's an abacus <laughs> with, uh, with vacuum tubes on it. Uh, the, the description... Again, this is from the portion I reread, so it's fresh on my memory. The initial description of a mech abacus is quite literally that it is like an abacus coated in glue and rolled around in a bowl of transistors and vacuum tubes. So it, 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 we're, we're, we're dealing with kind of middling steampunk cosplay at best here, so don't get your hopes so I up. Could, I could go make one right now, is what you're telling me. Uh, yes. I'm actually going to go to the electronics recycling center and go get a bunch of transistors. <laughs> Only if they've been there, too. How would that too. work in the smoggy atmosphere? Is it also coated in, yeah. like, saran wrap? <laughs> From what I gathered, a lot of the guild stuff is sort of, like, underground, kind of, in a way. Like, maybe I'm pulling from the second book, but it's always kind of described as of places of, like, very little light and, like, no windows. And I'm just like, I'm assuming you've somehow recycled air in here because <laughs> I feel right, but he chills, like he chills on the airship with it. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Like if people can't breathe the air, why can exposed transistors and abacus abaci? I can't even, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Abacuses. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, and they're using their jetpacks all the time in the initial scenes as well. That's got to cause a little bit of an issue with pollution. Yeah, I would think they would like explode due to the pollution. Like there'd be a bad reaction in there somewhere. Just pff. no, no more jetpack. So do you want to talk about how, how the book all ended? Do you have any thoughts on, did you, did you like the ending? Did you not like it? Do you think it set up stuff for the next books at all? Well, the final battle, I felt, was a little bit contrived, where they ultimately, um, Christoph faced a problem that uh, a lot of different fantasy authors face, which is how do you make a relatively average person a threat to someone with some sort of, you know, mystical power, in this case, you know, Griffin riding. And he just sort of falls back on. He has a gun. And (laughs) this whole um, confrontation ends up with uh, Masaru dying and ultimately, you know, the whole, you know, rebellion breaking out and everything. I felt that that end, just as some of the interior shots of the palace were too slow, suddenly this went a little bit too fast again to try to compensate. And suddenly he is uh, cut down pretty rapidly. Her dad's immediately dead. She's immediately sad, immediately gets over it, and then immediately, you know, starts putting off, you know, pirate radio broadcasts and making speeches. And it all felt um, just very, very fast to me. Anyone else have thoughts? Rebecca? 
Yeah, I liked the ending. I mean, I I did go into the book knowing it was part of a series, so I was expecting the ending to be a lot like it was, which was all heck broke loose, and we're going to have some sequels. So, I don't know. Um, I honestly, I think you were supposed to be super affected by the death of Yukiko's father. I was not. Um, Neither was I. So, Mm -mm. I I don't know. So, that was probably a huge emotional impact moment that did not have any impact on me. Um, I knew she was going to kill the Shogun, so that wasn't, like, that exciting. I thought it was kind of cool how it happened. Um, I was into that, except I was a little upset because I totally have a story that I started writing eh, maybe like 10 years ago where um, my main character has a similar power to Yukiko's and totally drives the antagonist insane when she realizes that humans are animals and she can get into his head. So that was like, it hurt me a little bit in my heart to realize that I'm apparently not original. Um, But really, I don't know. Like I, I thought the ending was pretty solid for the ending of a first book of a trilogy. It was like, okay, our main storyline is closed, and now we're opening up a whole new world of storylines. Yay! No, and I, I had actually forgotten about this. There's also the prison sequence where the royal spy master, who has been merely present for a handful of scenes, gets a few guys. And in that sequence, I think it's Kasumi and does Uncle Akihito? Do they both die, or is it just Kasumi? Um, I think they both get it. Yeah, it's just, it, it was like the um the supporting character death box that they see <laughs> just in that yeah, all so, these, everyone else got herded in and no one came out because <laughs> it wasn't important yeah, to the storyline. Yeah, so I was like really confused, honestly, listening to it um, because it seemed like that was like a huge plot, right? That they a bunch of people in the prison and they're going to get away and go somewhere and do something. I don't even remember what their plan was. There was a ship that was going to take them somewhere that they wanted to go. I don't know. Um, but then, like, they all died in a death trap, essentially, which was not surprising to me because it felt really cliche. And also, until this moment, I forgot that that was a whole plot. So that also apparently had no impact. Yeah, especially because it was also the scene where I think, does the book, I think the book actually opens up with the royal spy master, uh, who is also another um, Lotus addict who just I mean, kind of, of comes and goes yeah, in a few I, of these scenes. Know. And. Yeah, and I feel that, uh, again, Yukiko and Buru, they're the best characters, no doubt. But I feel there was probably a more elegant way of having everyone exit stage right, other than having them all die at the same time in a what amounted to a subplot. And I guess exit, none of us were exit really pursued attached by bear. to them. <laughs> no, but in this case, the bear kills them, and then the bear dies too. At least the bear was a compelling character. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> There definitely could have been a better way for a lot of them to exit pursued by metaphorical bear. Um, I'll say my thoughts on the ending. I did think it was kind of fast. Like I, maybe it's because I really love action in books that I would have loved to have this like super involved long action sequence at the end. And I was just like, Oh, I wanted a lot more of that. Oh, that's a bummer. But I think I was also fortunate in that I had already bought the first two books. So literally I closed the first book and just immediately opened the second and just went right on in. So I was like, oh, this is sort of like getting a slightly longer ending in the opening since it picks off pretty much, you know, immediately after the first book ends. But I did think it was rather quick and that a lot of people died rather suddenly. And I either did not get the chance to mourn them slash didn't care enough because they weren't Yukiko or Baru, which <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. The two characters I like are fine, so moving on. <laughs> but I do wish it had been longer. Maybe it's my own guilty selfish love of action sequences and books that I wish the ending had been a little more involved. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, Mads, of course, read the sequel already. Are you guys actually interested? Will you Will you keep reading? Um, I will eventually. I have about 18 books on my to-read list before the sequel, but I do plan on reading Kinslayer. So, I mean, I liked the story. Towards the end, I got really interested in Kin, and I'm led to believe that he is, like, a main character in some of the following books, so that's pretty exciting for me. And, I I mean, I liked the book. I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. Uh, I probably won't get it on Audible, assuming that Jenny is still reading it, because I can't, I can't, I can't do it. But, um, yeah, no, I'll definitely read it. 
As for me, probably not, at least not in the immediate future. I have some other books that I'm currently getting through, and this really didn't hold my attention to a, uh, especially in the ending, like some other stuff is. So but perhaps later, but it, for now, no. I don't really intend on reading them either. I think if I had a bunch of bad options, um, like if my choice was... Uh, Gone Girl, The Girl on the Train, Fifty Shades of Grey, and the sequels. <laughs> I think I would pick the sequels. Um, but there's so many books out there that interest me more. It's funny that you mentioned The Girl on the Train. Cause, so something I was going to mention is that we're now an Audible affiliate. So we have a special URL where people can go to get a free trial of Audible and a download of a book. And one of the things Audible suggests that we promote is The Girl on the Train. I do but, not promote uh, this, and I will not be associated with promoting this. Oh, no. <laughs> if you want to read a book only about, because it's a bestseller. If you want to read a book about yeah. an alcoholic who passes out all the time, read A Million Little Pieces. At least that has the intrigue of, like, is it real or not? <laughs> Don't read The Girl on the Train. But yeah, so speaking uh, It's of, because it's a bestseller yeah. and it's going to be a movie. No. Of course. Of- mm-hmm. Anyway, so we have a special URL for all listeners. It's audibletrial.com slash the book table which gets people a 30-day free trial and a free audiobook download so um you know what we don't recommend which is the girl on the train and <laughs> storm one. dancer but i think some of you are listening to our current book club right Ooh, yes yeah, i am and i recommend winless, that mm-hmm. um i have the aeronauts winless on audible and actually our next month's book club as well shadow shaper i also have that both of them super solid Wow. Yeah, I am really, really enjoying the Aeronaut Swinless on Audible. So if you can get that for freezies, I recommend. I'm not an audiobook person at all. In fact, I actively dislike audiobooks. Um, I canceled my Audible. <laughs> um, but it was like, wait, before you go, have another free book. And I was like, well, okay. Uh, so I did get Aeronaut Swinless and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. The narrator is very good. So that's my rec for that. Awesome. And I don't think we're doing a, a podcast on that, but our next month book is scheduled. Is that correct? Yeah, Shadow Shaper, we will be doing a TBT on. Okay, so if you want, if any of our listeners want to get their Audible trial and get that, um, we have some recommendations. Um, okay, so and you, do you guys want to say anything else about the book? I'll just say that um, in terms of Jay Kristoff's work, I mean, having read the whole trilogy, I thought it got better. I don't list it as probably one of my favorite things I ever read, but when I read it, I enjoyed it. Um, But I do think if you want to read better characterization or anything else that Jay Kristoff is involved in, he did release a book this past October called Illuminae with another writer called Amy Kaufman. And I think it's like, any of the kinks he was working out in terms of relationships or anything else like that in uh, the Lotus War trilogy, everything got worked out for that book. And it probably helped that he had a co-writer who was a woman to help him in that front. I don't know. That's all I can really say is that I enjoyed the trilogy as I read it. But I have to say in terms of Jay Kristoff's work, I liked Illuminate better. <laughs> yeah, I heard really good things about that. I didn't realize it's it was the same pretty- person. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. It was part of why I picked it up in that because the idea of how it's been put together, for lack of a better way to say it, um, it's assembled like this huge dossier of like secret documents and chats and IMs and video feeds. And it's very cleverly put together. And the characters are so incredible. Um, I was really actually into it. I might have to check it out. I just keep hearing about it. It sounds awesome. It's like one of the most beautiful it's, books I've ever seen in my life. Just like physically looking right? at it. Oh my God. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, I require, I acquired like six books over the holidays because people know that I like <laughs> books. So that's what I get as presents. Um, so yeah, we have all these books to read now. So maybe if I ever finish them all. So all of our listeners, in two weeks, on February 10th, we're going to be releasing Sex and Fantasy, our Valentine's special, where we talk about issues of sex in various fantasy novels, literatures, bodies of literature. And so it's going to be really exciting. So stay tuned for that. And hopefully it won't be hastily assembled like a plum pudding. (laughs) (laughs) We need to make some t-shirts. Yeah. All right. I think we're all done. So Sure. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 
Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash thebooktable. The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes, or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. Tune in again next time. Thank you.